And we are live. Okay, welcome everyone. Greetings and welcome back to Local Writers Read. This is the start of our July event and we're very excited to be back and doing this again. Um, for those who don't know, I am Josh Gothier and I'm here with my co-organizer Claire Guyton. And we have three lovely guests joining us this evening. Um, we'll do introductions in just a moment. Um, but for those who are maybe new to our series for the first time, uh, we are a literary reading series spotlighting main writers, authors, poets um, across um, disciplines, across forms and styles, but um, from all over the state. And we partner with Quiet City Books, um, where in normal times we would be in Quiet City Books bookstore um, in downtown Lewiston. And we're also co-sponsored by the Lewiston Public Library. Um, so big shout out to both of them for being so supportive of this series from its in, um, inception. And we are looking forward to, um, once we're through this pandemic, getting back together again. So hopefully we'll see a bunch of you there when that time comes. Um, but for tonight, we are kicking off part one of two of um, our series. And our theme this time is Strange and Travelers. Um, we assign a very broad theme to each event that we do and invite our readers to interpret it really however they want to. Um, so Strange and Travelers, Claire and I were talking about, we're thinking of journeys and discoveries and new horizons and new experiences. And so there's a myriad of ways to take that. And I'm very excited. Um, I've heard all three of these authors read before. Their work is excellent. And I'm very curious to see um, how each of them approaches our theme this evening. Um, so buckle in and enjoy, and I will turn things over to Claire to introduce our readers, and then we will get started. Great. Welcome back, everyone. And welcome back to our lovely readers who are all good friends of the series. Very excited to hear from you again. We're going to start with Shannon Bowring. Shannon's work has appeared or is forthcoming in numerous journals and has been nominated for a push cart and a best of the net, as well as selected in 2021 for best small fictions and as a finalist for the main literary awards. Shannon is pursuing her MFA at USM where she currently serves as editor in chief for the Stone Coast Review. She lives in Bath. Next, we'll hear from Jenny O'Connell. Jenny's debut book project, Finding Petronella, traces her 2014 solo trek across Finland following the footsteps of a female legend beyond the Arctic Circle. A main literary award finalist and Pushcart Prize nominee, Jenny's writing has appeared in or is forthcoming from Creative Nonfiction, Main Magazine, Backcountry Magazine, Slice, Appalachia Journal, and Hippocampus, among others. Jenny earned her MFA in creative writing from Stone Coast. Anthony D. Farr will take us home. Anthony is a main transplant from Georgia, cubicle jockey, writer, and wannabe superhero. Anthony's stories have been featured in five Wolf Singer publishing anthologies, and he is the author of the novel To Tread the Narrow Path and the story collection The Albatross and Other Tales. He's currently looking for a home for his fantasy horror novel, The Space Between Our Dreams. Okay, I am really excited to hear this work, guys. So take it away, Shannon. Okay, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Are we good? Okay. This is a short story I wrote called Afternoon on the Rhine. The luxury cruise liner slips its way up the wide river under dappled sun and shadow. Villages cling to either sloping bank, white steeples rising into the air. Claudia has been looking forward to this, an entire afternoon free from tourists pushing and shoving to get pictures of crowded cathedrals and cobblestone squares. No awkward, failed attempts to speak to the local people in foreign languages. No haggling shopkeepers over the price of a cuckoo clock. Another drink, man? Claudia looks up from where she sits at a round white table on the sun deck of the ship. A server with thick, dark eyebrows and a severe widow's peak smiles down at her. No, thank you, Darius, she says, handing over her empty glass. But my husband might want something when he joins me in a few minutes. I will come back, of course. Last night, Claudia overheard the young, giggling bartender say Darius is from Romania. She's always thought Romania sounds like a place of legend more than an actual country. Then again, she used to think that about most places other than her little hometown in rural Maine. 
Tell me, Darius, how many times have you gone up and down this river? Too many times to count, he says. Don't you get sick of it? With guests like you, ma'am? Never. Oh, yeah. Claudia guesses Darius is about Seth's age, maybe a little older. Certainly not a day past 25. She considers sending her son an email to tell him about the potato dumplings she and Bernie ate last night in Cologne, a dish so simple and yet so perfect they both ask for seconds. But she thinks better of it and tucks her phone into her bag. She settles back and watches the, watches the river flow by. Time is like molasses today, passing so slowly it might cease, it might almost cease to exist. Claudia wouldn't mind if it did. She wouldn't mind that at all. At six feet, seven inches tall, with a body heavy with muscle, Bernie can't help but cast a big shadow wherever he goes. That shadow has sheltered Claudia for 30 years, ever since they got married at the Dalton town office one humid June morning, a week after their high school graduation. It covers her now on the deck of the Frigga, creating a momentary spot of coolness on the back of her neck. Bernie eases himself into the seat next to her. Did you win, dear? She asks. Carl cheats. Does he really? No, damn it. Man's just better at chess than I am. Did I tell you he and Jackie own 60 acres in Vermont? Claudia has heard this at least twice since they met Carl and his wife at dinner the first night of the trip. No, dear, she says. I don't think he did. Bernie scratches his bearded chin. 60 acres, we could have those horses you always want. I don't imagine riding would be comfortable anymore. They glance first at her ebony cane leaning against the table, then at her right leg. Though it's covered with her jeans right now, Claudia knows they're both picturing the ugly, still red scars running along her calf and half halfway up her thigh. Well, Bernie says, something to think about anyway. They gaze out over the calm river, the villages, the terraced hills. It's the first time abroad for either of them. The trip was a surprise anniversary present from Seth and his fiance. It had felt wrong to let them cover such an extravagant expense, even with Avery's fancy job in Portland and Seth's recent promotion at his IT company. But refusing the trip would have been an insult, so Claudia had gone along with the whole silly idea. It'll be good for you, Ma, Seth had said. I think some distance will help. Three weeks in Europe, a grand adventure, the experience of a lifetime. She'd wanted to flee back to the county as soon as the enormous jet began to taxi down the runway in Boston. She should feel lucky, Claudia knows this. She hears it all the time, from doctors, from friends, from people in their small town. Melly Martin stopped her on the sidewalk outside the library a couple weeks ago to tell her how blessed she is to have survived the accident, even with all the rest of it. Claudia had offered a tight-lipped smile before limping away, her cane tapping out a faltering staccato every other step. Have you had, any, have you had anything to drink yet? asked Bernie. She can still taste the floral sweetness of the last cocktail in the back of her throat. No, she says. I was waiting for you. Darius returns to take their orders. Beer for Bernie, gin and tonic for Claudia. Will anyone else be joining you? Claudia is about to say no when she sees Carl and Jackie ambling toward them. At Bernie's invitation, they take the remaining seats on the opposite side of the table. Claudia tries to appear gracious, but she is disappointed. It would have been so nice to sit here with her husband and not talk for a couple hours. Carl orders a scotch on the rocks and Jackie asks for a glass of red wine. Daria sets off at a brisk pace to fetch their drinks, leaving the four of them to make small talk. Sun's trying to come out. Forest didn't call, for, forecast didn't call for so much cloud cover. Don't the shadows make for interesting colors? Wish I had my paints in them. I'll take a picture for you, dear. Carl and Jackie are older than Claudia and Bernie by at least a decade, but they both look younger. Carl is tall and slim with a swimmer's body, blonde hair, and blue eyes. Jackie has snowy white hair she keeps swept back from her high forehead. Her eyes are a brilliant green, complexion smooth and bright. Claudia, whose wrinkles began to gather at the corners of her eyes a number of years ago, dyes her dark brown to mask the unruly grays that seem to multiply by the dozen every month. Darius returns with her drinks. Claudia wonders if he has a girlfriend here on the ship, or a boyfriend, or maybe both. He winks at her. Would anyone like anything else? Isn't he a darling? Asks Jackie after Darius has disappeared. This is the third cruise we've taken with his company, and the staff is always so great. Third cruise? Asks Bernie. 
all here in Europe? First time on the Rhine. We did the Danube last year and the Seine before that. Sights on the Mekong for the next one. Jackie beams at Carl. Hear that, Claudia? Bernie muses. The Mekong. Can you imagine? Claudia takes a long time swallowing her gin, savoring the taste. So cool, so light, so lovely. I've heard Vietnam's beautiful. Bernie leans forward as Carl goes on about rice patties and floating markets. Claudia watches as another ship pulls into dock at a small village. Guests on board catch sight of the frigate, wave with wild arms. She remembers a muggy August day at their camp on New Head Lake. Seth was four years old, skinny little thin in his red swimming trunks and white t-shirt. Denise, his six-year-old sister, wore a glittery purple bikini she'd selected from the tourist shop in Greenville. Bernie had taken the kids out in the boat that afternoon while Claudio remained on the dock with a book and a sweating glass of lemonade. He kept driving the, driving the boat past the dock at Denise's insistence, just so the little girl could wave to her mother. Claudia waved back every time, laughing at Denise's energy and used by Seth in his white buckled caution as he crouched in the bow, clutching the orange life vest that pushed his ears and his shaggy brown hair. In the first weeks after the accident, Seth had been around all the time, sitting by Claudia's hospital bed after each surgery, cooking for her and Bernie, driving her to her PT appointments. But after Christmas, Seth went, Seth went back down the state. But by February, he was only texting once every few days, saying the four hour drive back north was just too long. Maybe he'd come up the next or the one after that. Avery had called Claudia to talk about it. He loves you, she said. It's just that he was there that night too, you know? And he still hasn't really dealt with it. Claudia realizes the others have fallen silent and are looking at her expectantly. I'm sorry, she says. What were you saying, Jackie? Just that I feel like we hardly know each other. Do you have children? Claudia waits for Bernie to answer. Our son Seth is 23. He's getting married next summer. How wonderful. What does he do for work? Something to do with computers, way above our heads. Carl laughs. We've stopped pretending to understand what our kids do. With six of them, sometimes it's just enough to know they're not living in squalor. Six? Asked Claudia. Two together and two each from our previous marriages, says Carl. Family reunions are a nightmare. Especially when you add in all the chaos of the little ones. Seven grandkids, another on the way. Do you see any in the future for your son and his fiance? Bernie finishes his drink in one quick swallow. Seth and Avery don't plan on having him. But we actually do have a granddaughter, Ella. She'll be five next month. We don't get to see much of her though. She lives with her father in New Hampshire. Carl and Jackie Fan. She was our daughters, explains Bernie. But Denise passed away last fall. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, says Jackie, covering her mouth with a smooth, slim hand. And here we are prattling on about our kids as if as if you have enough to spare. Thanks, Claudia. Carl twirls the ice in his tumbler. Look at that. He says, the clouds are breaking up. Claudia sucks on a gin, sucks on a gin soaked lit lime wedge as Bernie asks Carl and Jackie about their place in Vermont. The property taxes are high, there's no getting around that. She stares in her glass, watching the bubbles rise to the surface of the drink. If she bends her ear close enough, she can hear them pop and fizz. Denise's drink of choice is wine. The trouble started when the girl was 15. Parties, booze, a string of loser boyfriends, drug skin girlfriends. Body and Bernie thought things would change after Denise got pregnant when she was 20. And for a while, it was better. She sobered up and moved in with Brandon, who worked at the lumber yard with Bernie. She even began taking some online classes in medical transcription, just as Claudia had done years before. But by the time Ella was three, Denise was back at it, drinking one or two bottles of wine a day, often disappearing for days and returning hungover, claiming not to remember where she had been or who she had been with. Brandon quit his job and left, taking Ella with him down to his mother's house in North Conway. Across the river, Claudia sees a village of red-roofed houses and wonders what it would be like to live there. She could choose a new name, sell postcards to tourists, let her hair turn as gray as it wants. She'd be that strange American who lives with seven cats in a studio apartment above a restaurant that always smells like schnitzel and beer. Darius appears at her side again. He's leaning toward her, smiling. And Claudia grabs his wrist and holds on, blinking up at him. His face swirls above her. He pulls free from her grasp and stalks away without looking back, shoulders pushed up to his ears. 
Only then does she notice the rest of them staring at her. How about that man? She asks. Do you think Dracula was ever so handsome? No one answers. Claudia drinks. Ahead of them now is a massive rock approaching over the Rhine. Claudia has heard the tour guides talk about the Lorelei, the siren who sits high up the cliff and combs her long golden hair, luring sailors to their deaths on the rocks below. Claudia knows it's just a story. But still, she swears there's something about the cliff that really does feel haunted, as though she can sense the memory of all the men, real or imagined, who crashed on those rocks and slipped breathless beneath the water. It's the same kind of haunted Claudia feels each time she passes the stretch of road back home, where a spindly white cross slumps on the shoulder of the paper. In the weeks after the accident, people also left pink bows, teddy bears, garish carnations. Now, eight months since Denise died there, it's just the cross that remains, whether by wind and rain and the winter that didn't want to end. Are you two going on the dinner tour in Brudishan tonight? We'll probably stay on the ship. Claudia's legs been bothering her. Can I ask what happened, Jackie says? He just seems so young to be using the cane. We were in a car accident, Bernie answers. The whole family. I just had a few bumps and bruises, but our son fractured some ribs and sprained both wrists. Claudia broke her leg in two places. Oh dear, how long ago? Bernie looks away toward the gray green shore. Last fall, Jackie's voice is soft. Is that how you lost your daughter? Claudia finishes her drink and gazes toward the cliff. It's closer now, maybe a hundred yards away, and looks as though it's rushing at them instead of them moving toward it. She'd had the same sensation that cold October night when Denise swerved into the opposite lane of Route 11. For the briefest of moments, time stopped, and all that existed was the lot truck bearing down on them, closer and closer and closer. One moment, Claudia had been asking Denise about seeking visitation rights with Ella. The next, Denise was sobbing and speeding toward the truck, knuckles white against the wheel, and Bergman and Seth were shouting from the back seat, and Claudia did the only thing she could think to save her daughter, to save them all. She threw herself over the center console and yanked the steering wheel from Denise's hands, overcorrecting the vehicle back into their own lane and onto the shoulder, up and over and down and over again. Later, as Claudia lay woozy in a hospital bed, the police told her that Denise's blood alcohol level had been twice the legal limit. Impossible, she insisted. She's working the program. She has a job. She's doing better. Bernie and Seth would help Claudia piece it together. Denise's lies about attending meetings, the truth that she had been fired from the grocery store for stealing booze, that Brandon had called to tell Denise he was petitioning for full custody of Ella. Claudia stares up at the lower line, practically on top of the wall, its shadow blocking the sun, and swears she sees a flash of gold at the top of the cliff. As the ship rounds the bend, she cranes her neck for a better look. And there it is, not a myth, but something solid, something real, a woman in white at the top of the rock, combing her long hair. Then she vanishes. Claudia blinks, trying to find the woman again, but there's nothing there other than trees and mossy green rock. Jackie's voice is low, murmuring with water rushing over pebbles. People must tell you how lucky you are to have survived. All the time, says Claudia. Jackie gazes out toward where the river kisses the sky. Idiots. The frigga continues up the river, clouds gone, sent out to stay. Later, Claudia will email Seth, tell him about those potato dumplings and the castles on the hills and the villages where she will never live. Wish you were here, she'll say. Sounds great, Ma. Seth will write back tomorrow or the next day or a few days after that. Will there been all right? Neither of them will mention his sister. But she'll be there in the spaces between the words. And Claudia will know with absolute certainty that Denise, Denise would have written so much more. Thank you. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to Jenny. Thank you, Shannon. That was amazing. It's always such a joy to read among um, all these local writers. So thank you to Josh and Claire as well for your energy in organizing all of this. Um, I'm going to read a, an excerpt from my book, which is called Finding Petronella. It's about my 2014 solo journey across Finland in the footsteps of Petronella Vandermoor, who is a legend up in the Lapish gold fields. Um, 
and I met her just before she died. Um, and she, her, her words, her first words to me were, I walked to Lapland. Um, and so I got into her story. I started to understand what had happened and, um, and decided that I needed to follow in her footsteps. So this, this section takes place in Lemonyoki National Park, which is way up um, in the north of Lapland um, with some of the gold miners. This is from the middle of the book, but it's when um, at this point in the story, I have walked and hitchhiked north to Lemonyoki, arrived there with the gold miners um, and her daughter came over to spread her ashes in Lemonyoki and return her home. Um, and then I've just come back to stay. So this is called the office of the mayor of Miesi. With my feet on the bank of the river, it was easy to pretend I wasn't lost. I could go one of two ways, down to the place where the narrow, rich Miesi River tumbles over a waterfall into the mighty Lemonyoki, or up against the current toward the source. I stood tangled in the underbrush, aching and scratched and sweating, and wondered which way to choose. It had been late in the day when I'd set out from Coltahamina, and I'd taken my time. I picked a sprig of bright magenta fireweed, ate a handful of blueberries, watched the barren dome of Morgum Vibus interrupt the late daylight and resettle it in slanted shadows across the fells. Old Risto Talila was the first gold miner to offer me a ride on his ATV. When he motored by, I was schlepping my red backpack up Heart Attack Hill. Quitos e racas dan cavala, I told him, the phrase I'd been practicing. No, thank you. I love to walk. Whenever someone showed his concern for the woman trying to find her way around the wilderness, it plucked at my stubbornest parts. I hadn't come back to Lemonyoki to visit. I had come to know it. Quitos e racas dan cavala, I repeated an hour later to Aki. He asked where I was going. Pihilamaki, I answered, proud that I could finally pronounce it. The hut on Pekka Itkinen's claim that the gold miners used as a gathering place. It had been built by an old timer on the river's edge, which Pekka had torn to pieces with his excavator. A small moss covered cabin that would be mine for a week. Home, Aki said. I liked the sound of that. The trouble started when I realized I couldn't tell one fell from the other. Walking up on those fells is like being on the ocean without sight of the shore, each lichen-crusted hill rolling into the next. Eventually, I came across a one-room cabin built from faded gray wood. Smoke drifted out of the chimney. Mulis, the treasurer of the Gold Miners Association, answered my knock. I turned down two rides, I said ruefully. I heard, said Mulis. It was almost as if the Lemonyoki gold miners had called each other up when I'd arrived and said, look out, boys, we've got a wanderer. I did not ask Mulis how he knew. He had an eccentric gleam in his eye and funny, often surprising bursts of energy. And I didn't know what to make of him yet or how he felt about me. His real name was Kai, but nobody in Lemonyoki called him that, not even his partner, Anna Marie. Mulis Salkon Poika was the nickname the gold miners gave him when he arrived in Lemonyoki 27 years ago, just 19 years old, son of an immature river otter. He had been hiking to Norway to work at a fish factory when he saw his first raw gold nuggets in a jewelry shop in Inari. Wearing Levi's jeans and carrying a bag of flatbread and a couple cans of tuna, he caught the next boat out of Nirgalati to find out where they came from. Anna Marie gave me hot chocolate and a hunk of bread. Timid, sweet, and tough as metal, she had merry blue-green eyes and one long braid down her back, and she moved through the crowded cabin with the grace of a dancer. Their two young boys, sleepy in white and red pajamas, curled together on the single bed in the corner. Can you tell me how to get to Pihilamaki? I asked. Mulas flicked a stray lock of silver hair out of his eyes. I followed him to the door and he pointed to a lone pine in the distance. I thought my kids would have a happy childhood because they could fly kites all around and there's only one tree. But every time I hear daddy, they always manage to find that one tree. He waved his hand, walk to that tree. From there, turn toward the hill and you will find the path. Go left and then right and then left. It's easy. You'll see the Miesi. I thanked them both, hoisted my backpack onto my shoulders and set off in the direction Mulis had pointed. I went left and then right and then left until I was standing outside a cabin too big to be Pihilamaki with a familiar green ATV parked outside. 
Through a large picture window, a man with a shock of white hair sipped his tea. Risto Talila. Shit, I hissed. With my pride at stake, I turned and ran back the way I'd come. Now it was after midnight. The super moon was rising against a purple sky, washing the ground in silver. A faint breeze moved across the moss tips, giving the impression that it was not wind blowing across the fells, but tiny spirits moving in all directions. Somewhere out here, there was a cabin meant for me, but I was starting to worry I might never find it. You can come get me now, I said out loud to no one and immediately hated myself for it. Bending down, I dropped my fingers into the miesi. Water spooled around them, soft and cold. I could feel my old life sloughing off, the speed and frenzy of it. Burn me, I thought, when I die. Drop me in the wind over the Pacific, hike me up to the white smashed peaks of the Cordillera Blanca, bury me beneath a hemlock tree on the Sacandaga Lake. But whatever you do, bring me back to Lemon Yoki. Yesterday when I'd stood in the road and watched Solange's bus barreling south, it had felt like an ending of sorts. I hadn't anticipated that when I returned to Lemon Yoki, Petronella would feel more alive than ever before. I imagined her out here, wind whipped and sun browned and wild. She rarely washed the dirt from underneath her fingernails and never off her feet. I thought of the obedient ladylike things she was supposed to be and the ways she had shirked them. Had a similar space opened up inside her when she'd seen the moon rise over these fells? Had it come with the same grief? I can see myself now on that riverbank. 27 and shrinking in my own skin, afraid of stillness and death and what I was expected to become in the world. All those years I had thrown myself at rivers and mountain ranges, asking questions about women in wilderness, about where I belonged. All the ways I had questioned my worth, starting with my body, the strength and thickness of it, the way my pleasure erupted at the slightest touch, the freckles and fat and hair that felt untamed and like too much to love. If I could, I would take that girl's face in my hands, kiss her on the forehead, say yes, say listen. This is the work we all have to do, the stumbling around trying to locate what we've lost or what has been taken from us, the parts of ourselves we've shed and now want back. For me, it was the boundlessness I'd felt as a girl when I'd first stood among mountains, expansive, round, and rolling everywhere at once, and decided that I would be someone who could walk off into nowhere just to see where nowhere went. I had lost that girl, but I was here to call her home. I decided on left. Hugging the river, I picked my way through the willows and sedges until a black cabin roof materialized out of the thicket. Whooping for joy, I broke into a run. The plaque above the door read, the office of the mayor of Miesi, honor and humor. The mayor in question, Heiki Pihilamaki, had settled in this cottage in 1950, where he ruled over his government, a self-proclaimed conservation area as large as he could walk around in one day. He welcomed strangers in for coffee and issued passports to any friends who pledged to live in harmony with nature. Heiki was one of the few who lived in Lemonyoki year round, sentenced to life, the gold miners called it. He died in 1989, mere months after his health forced him to move back to civilization. The air inside was thick and smelled of tar and wood smoke. My headlamp beam fell on a pallet bed covered in reindeer hides. Too exhausted to look around, I undressed and crawled under them. Silence shrouded the room, a heavy black cloth. My breathing was the loudest thing. In the morning, I opened my eyes to a knock on the door. Pulling back the lace curtain, I spied Pekka Itkunen's red ATV parked outside. I dressed quickly and scrambled to get the door, hitting my head on the low cross beam as I did. Eyes watering, I answered with one hand on my head. I got lost and ended up at Moulis's, I told him. I know, Pekka said. He stepped into the one room cabin with an air of authority and began to make himself coffee. He boiled water on the gas stove and then shook coffee grounds into the bottom of the kettle and added hot water. This is how Heiki Pihilamaki made coffee, he said. While you stay in his house, you must do it this way. An ex-sommelier at a fancy hotel in Helsinki, Pekka had learned of lemon yoki gold in 1980. Three years later, he staked a claim at Pihilamaki, which he expanded into a mining district with his business partner, Pekka Salonen, who died a few years ago. His eyes still watered when he talked about his friend. 
Pega Ichkinen was a machine man. You could often hear him before you saw him, his puttering ATV, the buzz of his generator at night when he watched TV in his cabin, the rumble of his excavator, which he built himself. He moved through the world a bit like a machine too, crunching blueberries under his boots. Pekka piled birch logs into the wood stove. Plucking a knife from his belt, he peeled back the bark of the log into neat curls, then lit it on fire and tossed it in. I don't lend this cottage out to many people, he said. Keep it clean, don't break anything, don't burn anything down. He poured himself a cup of coffee and one for me. I followed him outside where he pointed out the other buildings of Pihilamaki, a food storehouse on stilts, an outhouse and a wood sauna. Moss covered and alive with birds, Pihilamaki Cottage looked as if it had risen straight out of the ground. Keep it clean, don't break anything, don't burn anything down. Make coffee like the mayor, got it. When Pekka left to start his gold digging day, I slid a pair of reindeer slippers onto my feet and rolled up my sleeves. The inside of the cabin was lined with dusty shelves filled with the belongings of the cabin's past inhabitants. Heiki Pihilamaki had moved here the year after Petronella left. Maybe if I held his things in my hands, I'd be able to understand the man who owned them, the time in which she lived. I grasped each item as if it were a porthole to another dimension, closed my eyes and imagined drinking the thing down, rubbing it into my skin, switching places with it, pitching into its secret life. A pair of dice, a tiny light bulb, a shotgun shell, a giant reindeer molar, one million Turkish larasi folded and pinned to the wall. I sniffed the contents of each vial, insect oil, tiger balm, cough medicine, tar, I peered through blurry reading glasses. I slid my hands over instruments of gold fever as if I too had it. The hanging scale above the table, the heavy magnets, the tubes of gold dust. Pekka came by to check on me. This time he didn't knock. I had just taken all of the books off the shelf, finished names next to American ones. Louis L'Amour, Esco Lauco, John Steinbeck, Margaret Mitchell, Sariola. He opened the door, looked around at the place and said, I have to check that you are home. He closed the door and went back to digging. I made sure to miss nothing. Pinned to the curtain, one gold earring without a mate. Beneath the loose floorboard, a broken wire. Under the bed, cans of stroganoff and meatballs. Behind a stack of books, a scrap of wood charred with the initials MM and a tube filled with a sticky substance that looked like blood. Suddenly afraid, I dropped the tube. It clattered to the floor. I rushed to put it back where I'd, I'd found it, apologizing out loud. I took one thing, a cassette tape titled Hakey Special Petronella. I'll bring this back one day, I promised the mayor of Miesi and slipped it into my backpack. I fell asleep on the pallet bed with my feet on the pillow, one hand resting on a pile of cans, drinking in the dust that swirled around me in the late afternoon light. In the evening, I woke uneasy with a feeling I'd stirred up something I shouldn't have. I flung open all the windows and considered sleeping in the storehouse. All I could think about were ghosts. I stoked the fire and put the kettle on, laid back with my arms under my head and stared up at the tarred ceiling. In my mind, I wrote the epitaph for my tombstone. Here lies Jenny, a woman who, I could not finish the sentence, who was never on time, whose curiosity was her undoing, who was not easy to date, who loved a great many things recklessly. The kettle began to boil and suddenly I was weeping. Great ugly sobs, which would have been loud were it not for the muffling effect of the dusty books and the wolverine tail hanging from the ceiling. Outside, brown sparrows flickered between windowsills of Pihilamaki cabin with moss in their beaks. Their wingtips brushed the glass. Here lies Jenny, I wrote, a woman who lived. Thank you so much. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Anthony Farr. Hey y'all, uh, thanks for Josh Player. Thanks for hosting us. Um, Chan and Jenny, they'll, they'll are amazing. I am always uh, thrilled to uh, hear other, other writers as we uh, do these things. And Maine is just a great treasure trove of people you know, with, with this talent. So uh, that being said, I'm gonna move into mine. Um, this is uh, from the uh, novel that Claire referenced when she was talking about my uh, um, 
my bio. Uh, so it's the space between our dreams. And just a little bit of a setup, since this is a little bit into the novel, you know, first one of the early chapters, um, a young girl named Allie has found her, her and her brother have been uh, dropped into this other world that's, uh, you know, manifestation of dreams, you know, kind of uh, think like an Alice in Wonderland type of a deal. Um, but it's just a nightmare and bad stuff happens to her. So um, going on with that. Nearby stood a small vintage dinner, stark contrast to the lush jungle and pristine beach. Allie approached the diner with caution. The smell of food caught her nose. Her stomach reminded her breakfast and lunch were far from her now. As she walked closer, she can make out the sign above the door. The gyre, best fish and chips this side of the nightlands. Allie paused with each step, tilting her head to the side and straining her ears. Each stair up to the front door creaked in sharp contrast to the nearby ocean waves. Allie opened the door with a trembling hand, revealing an empty diner. It looked like something straight out of the 1950s, a red countertop bar facing the grill, stools with the same red tops lining the bar. All the surrounding booths had the same color seats and tabletops. Allie crept further inside, swinging her head left and right, her eyes sharp as they inspected every corner of the diner. Her gaze lingered upon an inscription above the grill. The center cannot hold. Eats? She asked out loud, her voice thundering through the empty diner. Before Allie could investigate further, a scattering of metal pots sounded from the doorway to the right of the grill. Hello? She offered, her voice shaking. Uh, I'm not here to bother anyone. I just want some food. I'm starving. She gripped the board tighter in her hand and stood fast. A low growl rumbled from beyond the doorway. Darkness filled the doorway, and at first, Allie thought the light had been turned off, but she backed away at the realization that the body of a bear blotted the light. He ducked entering the room. As his head rose, he leveled his pitch black eyes at Allie, his mouth contorted into what she assumed passed for a smile on an enormous bear. Why, I have visitors for lunch, he said, his voice mixed with a deep growl. How then should I prepare you, my dear? He continued to walk toward her. Prepare me? Allie stammered, falling to the ground. She frantically scooted backward until she struck a booth, pushing further back under the table, trembling in fear. The bear shambled forward, dropping onto all fours. He sniffed her and pushed his head close to her face. Wet, scorching air wafted onto her face with each breath from his open mouth. He opened his mouth as if to speak again, but stopped short. Allie pushed back harder against the center post under the table and gasped. His enormous frame, or his once enormous frame shrank and his paws shifted and appeared more like hands with fingers and thumbs. He sat on his haunches with his head cocked to one side, not taking his eyes off Allie. You are different, he said with his nose raised, sniffing the surrounding air. Ah, there it is. You came through the mirror. The scent of the real is strong on you. It has a calming effect on me. I'm sure that if I were an older resident of the so, there would be no effect. But I feel my mind coming back to me. He stood and extended a paw out to Allie. My dear, I'm dreadfully sorry for my actions. Those of, you, those of us trapped in this nightmare are a little better than base animals, as you can see, sometimes literally. He thumped his chest with his other paw and continued, come now, you will not be harmed by me, at least not as, a, as long as I'm in charge of my faculties. Let us find you something to eat. Allie took his paw and he lifted her squarely onto her feet. She took quick steps back out of arm's reach. Have no fear, little girl, the bear said. I'm no longer the savage that desired to devour you. He walked away from Allie to the other side of the diner's bar and grabbed a spatula and a frying pan. He procured various items from beneath the bar and the refrigerator, and soon the smell of grease wafted over to Allie. She remained distant from the stool, staring at the back of the bear as he toiled at the grill. Please have a seat. I'm not to harm you at the moment. I'm not so deep into the madness that your light doesn't shine on me. Allie slowly approached the bar and slid into a stool, leaning the board against next to her, still within arm's reach. She rested her head in her hands and sighed. By her lips, she prayed to wake to find herself in her own bed, but each time she opened her eyes, she just saw the bear preparing breakfast. Who are you? Allie asked. Leaning forward, she pulled a straw out of the holder in front of her and wound it around her fingers. 
I've been here for the bear trailed off into a low rumble. After a moment, he continued for a very long time. I cannot remember exactly. I think I was reaped in the waking world in the year of 1235. I believe on the 8th of January. What is your year? 12? 35? Ellie gasped. You've been here for almost 800 years? If you say it, it must be so. I've heard time moves differently on this side, the bear responded as he continued to cook. My name was Bartholomew Fordham. In the waking world, I grew up in Hugh Connacht in Ireland. Norman invaders slaughtered my family, but I survived, alone, broken in this world. That's why I read, so readily volunteered for this hell. He turned and looked at Allie, his eyes wide and human as he stared at her. You volunteered to come here? Allie grasped his right paw in her hands. Why would you ever come here willingly? My dear, as the society found me in my broken state, they claimed my sacrifice to this world would hold it at bay, would keep the tides of madness from crashing into our world. They did not promise peace for me, but that my sacrifice would buy peace for the world. I was told that once per or twice per generation, someone from our world must be given over to the Sove to feed it, to keep it from devouring the waking world. He broke away from Allie and prepared her a plate of food from the grill. Bartholomew set the plate of scrambled eggs, bacon, and toast before her and offered what she assumed to be a smile. Allie grabbed the fork and shoveled food into her mouth, quickly finishing the plate, barely breathing between each swallow. S Sorry, I forgot to thank you, she said through her last mouthful. You've been so kind. Thank you. Do not thank me as of yet. I believe the peace I feel now is only temporary. Even now, the effects of the waking are waning. You should not stay much longer. I fear what I would do if you stayed until the madness returned. No, Allie shouted. I can't run. I'm so tired and I have so many questions. Please don't make me go back out there. Allie leaned over the bar and grabbed both his paws, pulling him close. You have to stay this way. I can't run anymore. She swallowed hard, forcing the bile back down. I just can't. I do not know how long we have, but I can help prepare you for your journey. He pulled away and shambled into the back room. Allie slid from her stool and followed him into the storeroom. She found him shoving food, plastic water bottles, and kitchen knives into a duffel bag. She placed her hand on, the sh on his shoulder and felt the sinewy muscle beneath the coarse fur tighten and quiver. Bartholomew, her voice quivered. Please don't leave me. I, I can't stand to be here alone anymore, please. She gripped her deeply entrenched fingers into his fur and forcefully spun him around. His left paw swept back, striking Allie in the chest, tossing her against the shelves behind her. She crumpled to the floor as kitchen supplies fell around her. Allie splayed out her arms in search of a makeshift weapon. She did not take her eyes off the transformation before her. Bartholomew dropped on all fours, and his bulk slowly increased. Allie could hear his breathing deepen and take on a low rumble that she could feel through the floor. Bartholomew, his eyes no longer human or filled with compassion, fixed his gaze upon Allie and plodded before her. He leveled his face and continued to stare, unblinking into her eyes. Allie broke away and closed hers tears streaming down her face as she struggled to keep from screaming. She felt the humid breath against her cheek and pressed further back against the wall. The beast has returned, my succulent little morsel. She felt every syllable against her skin as he talked. He continued, now I will dine on you, and when you revive, you will be one with the sove. Not today you won't. Allie screamed and threw a handful of spilled flour into the bear's eyes. As he reared back, paws wiping his face, Allie grabbed a nearby cart, pushed it into Bartholomew. He collapsed over it, flailing wildly into the air and bellowing as he blindly searched for Allie. She crept along the wall as he kept slashing out, striking nearby shelves and counters. Allie ducked his razor-sharp claws sliced above her head. When she reached the door to the dining area, she looked back at the duffel bag. Allie crouched in the doorway, staring at the supplies. Bartholomew, still searching for her, now did so in a more controlled manner. He stood on all fours, head swiveling, sniffing, and moving around the storeroom, hunting for any sign of his prey. She crept on hands and knees to the bag and pulled it to her chest. When she turned, a water bottle slipped out of the bag. Allie watched, frozen, as it tumbled twice towards the floor. Upon impact, the bottle bounced and Allie remained motionless as the sound cascaded around the room. Bartholomew turned and charged. 
She reached into the bag and pulled out the first handle she found. As the bear shifted his direction towards the door, Allie moved to her right and struck out the meat fork in her hand, forcing it into his neck, dragging it upward into his cranium. She clasped her hands over her ears as he let out a scream and clawed at the bloody handle protruding from his neck. Still blinded, he stood, stumbled around, attempting to dislodge the fork. What have you done? He screamed. You will pay for this. When I heal, I will hunt you down and make you pay. I will find you. He fell to the floor, blood, blood pooling around his head from his neck and his mouth, and he kept muttering, but Allie could not make up the words. I'm so sorry, Allie said through tears. You tried to be so kind. I'm so sorry this happened. I didn't mean to hurt you. Maybe I won't get the pleasure, Bartholomew said, his words garbled by blood, garbled by blood and bile. What do you mean? Allie froze in the doorway. He's coming for you, Bartholomew said as blood sprayed from his mouth. Who? By the hunger, my dear. The king has set the hunger upon you and will hunt you down. I wish I could be there to see it. I can smell him coming. You better run. It's not going to be pretty when he gets here. The hunger is coming for you. Allie settled the bag on her shoulder and sprinted out of the diner. As she burst from the door, she stood frozen, her mind in chaos, trying to pick a direction. She looked up toward the wall of trees. She did not pierce the veil of the jungle, but knew something was coming for her. Something deep in the primal part of her brain screamed at her, telling her to take flight. A loud roar broke, carried over the noise of the wild, echoing beyond Allie into the distance. She turned and sprinted the opposite direction. Each step thundered in her eardrums and rhythm with her pulse. She kept running and did not look back. Even when she heard the pain scream that sounded like Bartholomew, she still ran and did not look back. Thank you. Yay. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I think I say something like this every time, but I'm just going to say it again, that what uh, thrills us about these um, themes that we actually, we spend a fair amount of time <laughs> hammering out at the beginning of every season um, is we, it seems like it goes one way or another. We either get this amazing um, similarity, like people are just kind of pushing on the same kinds of themes and it makes for sort of this um, wonderful treatment um, of some of, uh, you know, some important question. Or we get extremely varying voices and material that are more sort of crashing into each other. But either way, it is just so satisfying. I just enjoy it so much. And this time, um, this time they were very different. Everything was, was so varied and it just was, I just love it. I just, it's just so fun. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get us started on our chat. And typically I go for the, the last person who read because we're, we've all just soaked in that material and we wanna jump and ask the questions. And then I realized when I was preparing for tonight that I should not do that because that person needs a little rest now. <laughs> so I, I don't know why it took me this long to figure this out, but uh, Anthony, I'm gonna give you a break and I'm gonna go back to Shannon and start with you. So we can all unmute um, so we can sort of chat naturally. Um, Shannon, my question for you is a craft question. Uh, so uh, as I read your piece, I was thinking about how well you handled that sort of cliched um, show don't tell rule. Um, so there are just a couple of details that really stood out to me that I really enjoyed. Um, and one of them was, you know, that we, we sort of get the idea that maybe Denise's, I'm sorry, Jackie's daughter learned to self-medicate from her mom. I think I have the right names, um, but, but you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and maybe it was Claudia, Claudia's, yeah, Claudia was the mom. Um, so we get that sense because of the gin and tonics and how she's obviously self-medicating herself. And so then you wonder about, you know, that little thread um, of guilt that's probably sort of tied into the whole experience that, you know, maybe Claudia self-medicates sometimes, but she's been able to have a, you know, it never took over her life, but her daughter wasn't the kind of person, you know, who could handle that. And so I'm sure everything she thinks about what happened to her daughter is colored by that knowledge in some way, or she keeps, she has enough cognitive dissonance maybe that she keeps it separate, but it's either way, it's a really interesting wrinkle in that character. Um, and then the, I find the final line so powerful 
Um, and it, it's really kind of a surprise ending too. Um, and then you realize it's been hinted at the entire time that the mother doesn't have the same connection and probably never will have the same kind of connection with the son. It was, it was her daughter that she really had the deeper connection with. Um, and so it, it really brings that loss more powerfully home with that final line. Um, so I know I'm talking too much, but I just, I love those two touches in particular because they're the kinds of things that when I've written a story, they don't sort of come, to, sometimes they do, but most of the time they don't really come to me until I've written the draft. I read the whole thing and I start thinking about the layers, you know, that I can, that I can give these characters. So could you tell us a little bit about your process and whether you wrote the draft and then discovered these things or did they sort of come up as you wrote? It'd be an interesting um, thing to know about your process, I think. Yeah, so I started out, everything kind of comes at me in kind of disparate ethereal ways and then they just kind of morph together really quickly and that's when I realized, oh, okay, that's how I can pull everything in together. So I was, I've been wanting to write a story about the Rhine River for a long time. Um, I was fortunate enough to go down and do a river cruise on the Rhine. It was absolutely beautiful. So I was think that was in my mind. And I write a lot about mothers and daughters and grief and loss. So that's always going on in there. And then the character of Claudia came to me. I just had this image of a sad middle-aged woman sitting on the ship and she's drinking. And I knew there was something to that. I kind of stumbled on the discovery that her daughter, Denise, was an alcoholic. That wasn't intended. Um, so as I'm writing, I'm, I'm finding out things about the characters just like my readers are. Um, and I do go back in later drafts and I, I smooth it all out. But that initial instinct was Claudia is drinking because of her. She's kind of like taking the place of her daughter. Um, I didn't, before you asked this question, I hadn't really considered if, if Claudia was a drinker before Denise died, but it's certainly possible. I, I like that readers can imagine the lives of my characters. I don't think I need to give you an entire, you know, overview of everything this character has ever done. I like that that's kind of up for interpretation. But when I was writing it, I thought she's almost turning into Denise now. It's her way of grieving. She's becoming her daughter. She absolutely, well, I don't know if it's fair to say she loves her daughter more than she loves Seth, but there's definitely a stronger connection there, which I, I was playing with throughout the whole piece. So I'm appreciative that you picked up on all of that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I sort of think of it as co-creation. I know some authors don't feel that way. They don't like it if people sort of go off and, and think of new things about characters, but, but I love it. I'm, I'm yeah. just, I feel like I've made a living character when somebody can do that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cause we can't know a person. Absolutely. So why should we know a character? Absolutely. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so I actually, I want to jump in um, and transition over to Jenny a little bit. Um, and Jenny, I've heard you read multiple I'm not sure how many pieces from this book now. And it's such a, a delight. Lot, a lot of them. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> it's so delightful every time and every new scene. Like, I, I love hearing pieces of this book. Um, so I've got kind of a big question, but we'll focus it a little bit on this particular excerpt. Um, like, memory and nonfiction, like, d just for me trying to think back of, like, things I've been through and trying to put those on paper feels like such a challenge. Just in normal life, and then you add in what you've done with walking across another country on your own, figuring out all of this, plus the, the legacy of this other person. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's like taking all of that experience and distilling it down into prose on a page that so, so powerfully conveys what happened? Um, but that just kind of what is it like going from one to the other? Well, oh, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, memory, memory is so interesting. And I think it's one of the things that actually keeps me coming back and back to nonfiction. Um, and in, in particular, creative nonfiction, right? Like there's, I, I often, when I teach a class, especially people are like, so wait, what is creative nonfiction? How is that different from nonfiction? And to me, it means like, 
it's not just facts, right? It, it involves memory, it involves like the personal, it involves, it can be dreams or feelings or um, imagined, uh, imagined moments, you know, like I did with, um, with Petronella, like wondering what she looked like when she was up on those fells, um, if her hair was windy or she, her skin was sun brown or, you know, I don't know that I wasn't, I wasn't there. I haven't seen, I've only seen a couple pictures and they're in black and white um, of her up there. And so, yeah, it's this interesting thing, but I think what shoots through all of it is that my um, loyalty here is to the emotional truth of the story. Um, it is to, I, I think that that is a really powerful form of truth to tell um, in a story. I think that things can get lost in the straight facts or the the things that have been written down because, I mean, who's recording history? Um, I one issue that I um, had in my research on Petronella was that every single account that I could find of her until I got there had been written by a man and they had all been um, kind of like guessing at her motives. And so part of my, um, part of my inspiration was, I think to sort of like reclaim that from a woman's perspective, reclaim that risk and that choice and that um, connection to wilderness and that, it's taken me, I've been writing this book for seven years <laughs> and it's taken me a really long time to figure that out. Um, and to really, I think where it comes in now, like the whole memory thread is that um, I am figuring out like present day, like right now, like I'm going to a writing residency tomorrow for two weeks. And this is like a big thing that I'm wrestling with is what it means to me in my life now. Um, the, the part that I read where I'm kind of looking back at my 27 year old self, that's brand new. I have not written from my now person. And so um, kind of, <laughs> this is a complicated answer for a complicated question, but um, kind of bringing that all together now is this question of um, trying to marry the emotional truth of my journey in Petronella's footsteps then and what it, is in my life now. Um, and yeah, that is the best way that I can think to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I think that's such a good explanation. And yeah, the, uh, emotional truth in creative nonfiction is always, I, I think you're right. I think that is a, a piece of what sets it apart is um, bringing people into the experience as well as the truth of it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. It feels very alive to me right now because it is what I've been thinking of myself and I've, um, yeah, I keep coming back to the idea that like, or the feedback actually from my agents, from others that I need to put more of myself in the story. And it's like, all right, I'm trying to write a memoir without me, but like, where is my memory in this? What is my, um, what is my part in it? And so um, thank you for letting me think about that for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm that much more excited about the project too, when you talk about it that way. And um, when you're, you're talking about what you're gonna do next at the residency, that adds such a nice layer that makes me look forward to it even more. Um, Thank you. So I have a question for Anthony, but before I ask it, Jenny, I have to say, keep it clean. Don't break anything. Don't burn it down. Is basically a motto for life. <laughs> oh, good. Make I coffee like the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sort of, I cut that part out, but <laughs> that last little piece, but I just was like, man, that's all you need for your whole life. Keep it clean. Don't break anything. Don't burn it down. You're done. Right. I, just, I love that. Um, so thank you for that. Um, okay. Anthony first, I have to mention the connection to the Goldilocks and the three bears story. <laughs> Um, and I'm wondering if you have woven more fable and folklore references into this world. But before you answer that, I also wanted to say my, my larger question, as you know, when I first read this piece, I thought it was a short story um, in a linked collection. Okay. And I was wondering, you know, I was thinking about, okay, he's, he's using all the stories to sort of build out the world because we're only getting, you know, kind of hints of, the, yeah. of that world in this story. Um, I'm actually... I, you know, my first love is short stories. So that's probably why my, my brain went there, but I'm even more excited actually about it's being a novel because now I see it's a, it's going to be even easier and more detailed. Like it's going to be easier to sort yeah. of elaborate the world within yep. a novel. 
Um, it's just that, that what you read just sort of, um, it took the, the shape of a short story so well um, which is great. I love it when um, when people are writing novels and when you have like a chapter or even a scene within a chapter that has such a tight structure like that. I think it just works so well because it propels the reader really well through yeah. the material. So anyway, um, tell us a little bit about your imagining of this world because now you have me so interested without spoiling it. I know you don't yeah. want to <laughs> give us any spoilers, but just tell us a little bit about that and answer the question about um, the folklore and fable piece of it, if you can. Yeah, so um, it's uh, it's this realm called the Sove. Um, and it's, it, if you've ever heard like Young talk about the collected unconscious, um, it's basically what it is. It connects the dreams of everyone. Um, it's where we get our stories from. It's where our stories live, you know, maybe not exact stories, but like archetypes and stuff like that. And, um, one of the, the the easiest way I can explain is that I like to use and I use it in the book too is that um, just as the laws of physics and math and gravity govern our universe, the laws of storytelling govern this universe. So part of Allie's journey through this is she has to fi she figures out and part of it is is finding it finding the path is she has to learn the rule like you know the hero's journey. So she understands, it's very, it's kind of meta, but she understands that, you know, okay, to move to the end and get out of this nightmare, I have to move through these steps. And it's very self-aware, aware about that. And, and, but the world as a whole is, is imagined as a world of dreams, you know, where we get our dreams from. And, you know, at some point in the long past, you know, something happened that turned it into a world, a realm of nightmares and, uh, you know, kind of referenced it with Bartholomew's story is that they, this group of people believes that by sacrificing people to it, it keeps that realm from bleeding over into ours. Okay. And the, the Goldilocks and the Three Bears, did, did you intentionally weave some pieces like that of folklore in it because that's what people would dream about because we're raised with those stories or... Well, yeah, so throughout the book, I've scattered some archetypes of different things and, and talk about different, uh, you know, analyze different things. You know, there's there's definitely, you know, um, fables. I don't think in this part, I actually thought about um, the Goldilocks and the Three Bears. That, that was not uh, key to this, but there are times where like, I, I'm, there are things that you could read it and be like, okay, this is definitely, um, you know, I, I was thinking of Alice in Wonderland when this scene, you know, popped up in my head or, or stuff like that but uh but yeah so there are definitely archetypes sprinkled here and there but um yeah th this was uh this was just you know i needed a scene at the diner and a bear seemed scary so oh come on now it's your subconscious you're so <laughs> right. it's, it's it's working on you too right? right so the goldilocks and the bear it came up in your subconscious and it wrestled its way onto the page <laughs> well and 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 fun fun little thing that you and josh uh you know, y'all heard me read from the Albatross when I released that. Mm -hmm. um, the bookend stories on that, the first and last Albatross reference offhand this realm. Part of the guy, part of the main character reading the stories is keeping a, a world of madness set, you know, at bay. Right, right, right. That's referencing this. So you're doing a whole universe. <laughs> right, everything's connected. Fantastic. I love it. Thank you. Good stuff. Um, I hate to bring us to a close, but we are actually a little bit past seven, so we will wrap up for tonight. Um, Jenny, Shannon, Anthony, thank you for joining us um, for this event. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear you read. Um, and thank you to Quiet City Books, the Lewiston Public Library, and especially to anyone who tuned in um, either live or if you come back to this later on Facebook, YouTube, our website, wherever you find it. Um, thank you for listening in, for supporting these writers. Um, definitely stay tuned for their work. Um, we will be back tomorrow with part two at um, three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, we've got two more fantastic readers um, and we'll be doing a bit, um, some poetry. Um, we ended up splitting this event prose and poetry, but um, two friends of the series, their work is excellent. So you'll be in for a treat there as well. Um, until then, everyone, uh, enjoy your evening and stay tuned for more. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks,